Okay, uh, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Asha, would you be able to lead us in prayer? Uh, yes, Pastor. Yes, please go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much for everything you have to do with my life. Thank you, Pastor. 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 Thank you, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Asha, for uh, uh, leading us in prayer. So we will continue from um, where we had stopped in the last class. So we saw how the lame man was healed. And um, after that, we had a certain reaction from the authorities, which was to question and interrogate Peter and John. So they go through the entire interrogation in uh, Acts chapter 4. Um, and uh, you know they are let go. And then we saw how the church, in a great time of opposition, chooses to pray, chooses to seek God for his favor, uh, and asks for boldness instead of uh, succumbing under pressure, instead of wanting to hide. They want to continue to serve God. So it was all too amazing for us to note. Then we also, towards the end of chapter 4, we saw how the community, the church community, lived in unity. They were committed to the teaching of God's word. And they were breaking bread, um, which was you know remembering the Lord Jesus and his work on the cross. And so their fellowship continued uh, in this way where they were focusing uh, on the Lord. And we also saw how there was sharing, giving to one another uh, that they practiced because of their um, you know, needs which existed in the Church of Jerusalem. And we uh, saw a man introduced, which is Barnabas, son of encouragement, who was uh, who's, who is spoken of as a wealthy person and a, a generous person at the same time who sold his possessions and who uh, brought the gifts to the apostles. So we will pick up from there. Uh, and so today we will be looking at Acts chapter 5. And I request us to please turn to this chapter. So we are still um, in a place where this amazing community is uh, together, people who are serving the Lord, people who are um, you know, dedicated to the fellowship of the believers. So uh, a lot of caring is taking place. We saw how Barnabas gave uh, into this community. So uh, we recognize from what happens in Acts chapter 5 that there were others also who were giving. So Acts 5 um, will throw light on a certain couple called uh, uh, Ananias, Ananias, however you want to pronounce it, or Ananias uh, with Sapphira, uh, his wife. And uh, they also had the heart to give. But something went wrong you know, in their giving. So that's uh, what we are going to look at. So Acts chapter 5, uh, it introduces uh, Ananias and Sapphira, um, and it says that they sold a possession. But what they did is they kept back of the proceeds. Okay, and uh, in this case, both husband and wife were aware that uh, something like that this had taken place, and they brought only a certain part um, and gave it to the apostles. Now. For us, in verse 1 and 2, we see the generosity of uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? Uh, but in verse 3, Peter rebukes um, uh, you know, Ananias. He says, 
why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself so there's generosity by the couple but there is a rebuke from the apostle so what really happened in this situation okay, that uh, that is something that we must look into so what happened is you know um, uh, as peter suggests here he says you have kept back a certain amount now how does peter know peter is functioning with the gifts of the holy spirit in first corinthians chapter 12 we have a list of the gifts of the holy spirit one of the gifts is the word of knowledge where god can supernaturally bring revelation on a you know a past event or an occurrence uh, or even you know something usually we we refer to something in the past uh, but word of knowledge could you know border on prophecy uh, it is a it is one of those prophetic uh, and revelatory gifts so um, you know there could be an element of future in it but in general uh, something to do with the past so as soon as this gift was brought to the apostles peter by the operation of the gift of the holy spirit a word of knowledge he rebukes ananias and uh, ananias and he says why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit okay so there is an influence of satan and that's how temptation works we know that so there is an influence but we will see we observe that it takes the human being or the believer to yield to the temptation also you know for that sin to be committed in this case why has satan filled your heart is one thing but um ananias lying to the holy spirit so him actually committing the deed uh, uh committing the sin is the other thing so we have a responsibility you know as far as uh, um uh, our walk of righteousness is concerned so it's not all like oh satan pushed me into it and i i uh, have i uh you know uh, had no say it's not like that satan influenced but um, ananias yielded so he lied to the holy spirit okay so that's what peter uh, came to know by by the holy spirit so lying to the holy spirit it's interesting peter could have said that uh, ananias lied to the church because this was about the community and about their accountability to one another but he points out that the sin was committed against the holy spirit and also uh, in this case okay the holy spirit he uh, we will we will see later that he is actually in the knowledge of the holy spirit being a person and uh, being a part of the trinity or the godhead okay so uh, what uh, ananias did was not so much against the church as much it was against god himself so it was huge the revelation that came to peter when this gift was brought so in what peter told uh, ananias he says you kept back okay you kept back so that is the issue here he lied to the holy spirit and he kept back some amount of money now uh, uh, let's go ahead and read you know the the following verses also then you'll have a full picture uh, verse 4 while it remained was it not your own and after it was sold was it not your own in your own control why have you conceived this thing in your heart you have not lied to men but to god so peter is saying that ananias of his own will 
decided to give to the church community okay so it was in his own will what he wanted to do and you know how he wanted to serve the body of christ but it seems like because the statement made there is and after it was sold was it not in your own control so it was his own will it was in in his control but it seems like he um he promised something but he did something else okay and it also seems like he was someone who wanted to do the right thing with the wrong motivation so earlier we looked at the testimony of barnabas you know how he uh, was commended for his generosity it's possible that ananias wanted a place of um, fame in the church community he wanted to be recognized as a so called godly uh, believer so on the outside there is generosity but deep within his heart are uh, uh, you know there there is an agreement with with satan okay, where uh, he wants other things okay deep within which would be fame which would be name which would be favor from the apostles uh, and you know all these uh, all these things which are not right before the lord so it just goes to show us that uh, ananias did something wrong okay why are we saying wrong when you look at that term kept back you kept back part of the price of the land for yourself is it wrong to keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself not at all it was his land and that's exactly what peter is saying it was your land everything was under your control but what ananias ended up doing here is um something like misappropriation you know it falls under the category of actually uh, the word which is used there in the greek word is nosphizomai uh, which means to misappropriate in the greek translation you know of the uh, old testament aken sin aken sin aken theft uh, in the book of joshua is described with the same word okay uh, nosphizomai so you you see that there is a connection in what aken did and what ananias also did and in the new testament in uh, titus 2:10 uh stealing that word stealing uh is described with the same word so ananias uh, uh, ananias had done something you know uh, which falls in that category of misappropriation um theft okay and uh, god was aware of what was done so he had he was doing something on the outside as if you know he kept his word and all that but actually he had uh, tried to cover up some of his actions you know behind the scenes now we know that god is an all knowing god we can't hide from him which is why even beyond what we do why we do it is so crucial uh and it's not right you know in our own lifestyle to uh, project an image of ourselves which does not exist in reality so in the case of uh, ananias um, in the area of giving it seems like he had done something really um, displeasing you know unto the lord and uh, no wonder peter is rebuking uh, ananias and he's saying look you, know, you kept back is appropriation a part of the price of the land uh, and you know he says things like you lied to the holy spirit you have not lied to men but to god so there there it is you know, he is calling the holy spirit as god uh, and god help you know god help the apostle peter to recognize the deeper things not just the things on the surface but what actually was going on um uh, and in the house of god you know when we studied about the church we looked at the various pictures of the church how you know god wants the church 
to be a bride, to be an army, uh, you know, a, a representative, a body, representative of uh, Christ himself. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's, it's a temple. It's a temple. And in a temple, the holy presence of God dwells. So God is not someone who can, who can, uh, you know, uh, sort of push sin under the carpet and still keep things moving. It doesn't work with God that way. Uh, and so in this case, holiness was being compromised. And uh, in the church of uh, Jerusalem and uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, as I earlier mentioned to us, it's a time of great revival. So we see that people are being uh, saved. Miracles are taking place. Uh, God's favor is seen, you know, upon the church. Um, so many things are happening. So, in a time of great revival, one observation is that there it will also be a time of great judgment. Somehow, you know, uh, there is little or no tolerance for sin. Some of us might look at what uh, Ananias did and say, "Why could couldn't he be?" um you know let go or uh, why didn't god just let it be okay he misappropriated the funds so many people misappropriate funds you know in today's day and age why why is Ananias Anani being rebuked but you see it's a time of a great revival and generally we see that we see that uh, you know in scripture and even in um uh, uh what do you uh, like church history times of revival there'll be great incredible um, manifestation of the presence of god deep revelation of the truth of god's word uh, and and so all these positive things will be in a heightened level and at the same time there'll be little or no tolerance for sin the slightest issues right it just uh, is exposed and god deals with it in a very uh, sort of a strict and immediate way so somehow that's how uh, it it works so that is the observation here from the uh, incident of uh, uh, ananias so what happened now peter rebuked ananias and uh, was that all uh, was he given a chance to change what he had done Okay, verse 5, it says, Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So what happened? Maybe Ananias thought that nobody will discover what he did. Okay, that he will have an image which is very different from the actual person he is or the actions you know that he's responsible for but when peter brought it up it surprised or surprise is a, a milder word it shocked him to the extent now we don't know how exactly he uh, fell down and breathed this last it just means he died he died that very moment so ananias died um uh, we could interpret it in the natural way that you know maybe he had a heart attack because of the shock or this and that so we don't know we don't know you know what were the physical uh, uh, responses of of his body his emotions but when peter recognized and called out what he had done it was unbearable for him so obviously something very evil has gone on behind the scenes he couldn't take it hearing these words he just fell down and he died okay so people call it the judgment of god judgment of god which came upon uh, a person like ananias okay so is it possible for a believer to um, be judged in this manner no we do know that uh, the bible talks about um, god's dealing uh, with people who are caught up in sin to such an extent that they have crossed that thin line of no return. Okay, the book of Hebrews talks about it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, 
scriptures also refer to something known as a sin unto death in 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Um, uh, there is, um, you know, uh, okay. So anyway, judgment, as far as judgment is concerned, even this kind of strict judgment is possible. But uh, let us understand that it's an extreme scenario. Okay, so we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't look at this as oh any and every uh, transgression missing the mark, okay, will cause God to judge the believers in this manner. So it doesn't happen. We know that we are under grace. We have been instructed by God's word to repent, to confess our sins, to trust in the power of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness so that is the norm but when you know we have a, a, a hardened conscience uh, it is possible for believers who have walked with the lord you know for uh, a long time to also um, fall back and um, uh, go astray so there are those extreme situations and uh, in those times you know such judgments can happen even to believers all right so that's what happened to ananias so he fell down he was so shocked that uh, god even gave peter the knowledge of his sin that uh, that verse 5 uh, second part of that says so great fear came upon all those who heard these things obviously you know when other believers heard about the judgment of Ananias, great fear came upon them. What kind of fear is this? See, it's a fear uh, such that there is reverence towards God. There is an understanding of the nature of God. You know, God will not go against his own nature. He's a holy God. He's a just God. He's a righteous king. So as the people heard um, about what had happened to Ananias, they would have understood that oh, we are serving, uh, you know, this mighty God, and uh, uh, we better not, you know, uh, move away from the path of righteousness that God has called us to. And we've seen earlier in in chapter four, we saw how the church had uh, incredible favor with the people. So. They had a good testimony with the people around. How do you get a good testimony? By uh, walking in integrity, by walking you know, righteously. So they already had a good testimony. And so when uh, they heard of things like this, about the judgment that came upon unrighteousness, their, their fear of God would have increased further. And you know, hopefully, you know, their hearts would have turned towards God, and uh, they would have made a commitment that, okay, God, you know, such things should not happen in our community anymore. So, great fear, and that also includes when I say reverence. Uh, there's also that sense of, uh, you know, um, being terrified that, oh, judgment of this extent can also take place. Okay, so those who heard these things, great fear came upon them. Verse 6. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. You know, it just shows the, the seriousness and the immediate way in which this judgment took place. That immediately young men or whoever uh, you know could could uh, take care of a situation like this, they came and they had to go and actually bury Ananias. Now, let's move on. Let's see what happened further. Verse 7, it was about three hours later. So uh, remember that we have a doctor who is writing this account. So Luke writing about an incident like this, um, it, it's very, you know, it, it's intriguing. Because he doesn't explain further. He just says, Peter told Ananias what had happened. Ananias was shocked hearing these words. Felt. So there's no more investigation or diagnosing, hey, what are the 
uh, you know what are those intricacies of uh, you know the things that took place no he just leaves it at that and the details he says about 3 hours later so not uh, very you know far away from this incident you have his wife 3 hours later his wife came in not knowing what had happened so obviously she does not know what has happened what about peter now how is he going to deal with uh, sapphira peter answered her tell me whether you sold the land for so much okay so what did we see earlier ananias gave an amount it was not the full amount that he got after uh, selling his property he gave he kept back a portion and he gave the remaining portion so peter is asking the wife this question tell me whether you sold the land for so much the amount which has been given to me is it the full amount or in other words he's asking her have you kept back anything okay let's see the response of sapphira she said yes for so much it's really um uh, sad in verse 2 uh, we saw that ananias had kept back a portion his wife also being aware of it okay so she knew that this was not the full amount but she lies to the apostles okay so it really takes you know that sort of a um i, I don't know what to call it like uh, such things can only be done when people don't fear god like you don't fear that god knows uh, the end from the beginning you don't fear him for um you know being a righteous judge you don't fear him for who he is his majesty his glory we think we can get away with anything that we could even um you know like uh, trick god so it's a very dangerous position to be in so ananias tried to do it no wonder you know he was shocked when peter told him uh, this is what you did uh, ananias and now the wife she's in agreement with the husband so there's nothing wrong in you know husband and wife being in agreement but the matter in this case is an ungodly matter okay so being in agreement over this matter is a very sad thing you know at least uh, in in such a matter hopefully she she had the fear of god <coughs> excuse me and she chose to do the right thing who knows she might have had a very different um, future from this point on but what did we read peter asked her tell me whether you sold the land for so much so you know just uh, in a sort of a very uh, bold way she says yes so much that's all we, we brought everything to you verse 9 then peter said to her how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the lord he's accusing sapphira of the same sin which he accused ananias of what is that you lied to the holy spirit in this case he says you've agreed together to test the spirit of the lord you see then uh, uh, peter had said that you lied to god you do not lie to men but you lie to god now he's saying spirit of the lord so the understanding in the early church about the person of the holy spirit was it was growing okay so they were aware that the holy spirit he is god he is lord and so they lived in surrender in uh, you know adoration of the holy spirit just as much as you know they understood the deity of 
Jesus Christ, and they preached it everywhere they went, just as much you know as they uh, uh, they worshipped the Father with their Jewish knowledge. So the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the early church had a good understanding of the Trinity. So uh, in this passage, Peter is primarily talking about the the um, um, response to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so whatever Ananias and Sapphira did, Peter is saying you didn't do it against the believers of the church or the church community. You have done it against the Holy Spirit. You have done it against God. So he rebukes her. He says, "You, how can you test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out." Okay. So he says that strange. Now again, Luke doesn't diagnose it medically. What happened? You know, when Peter said this, do you think she had a heart attack? She had this, that. We don't know. But judgment came upon her, and verse ten says, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. So what happened to her husband happened to her, and. Scripture say, and the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out, buried her by her husband. Verse eleven. So great fear came upon all the church, and and upon all who heard these things. So, who God is, the person of God, the nature of God it was like, sort of, um, you know, a, like a deep understanding of of that was with the early church. So when people heard these things, they would have understood this is a real God. He's a living God. And you know, he's a just and a righteous God. And as I told us, in times of revival, uh, we might see great judgment also. right? So um, and this is how things unfolded in the early church. And just want to remind us, you see, earlier, we were looking at uh, external problems, right? So you had um, people outside who said, these men seem like they are drunk. You had the authorities rebuking Peter and uh, John and telling them, don't ever proclaim you know, this name again. Don't preach in the name of Jesus. So these are external threats, external pressures, external issues that the church had to face. And we saw a beautiful picture of the early church. Oh, here there are people, they are caring, they are praying in one accord, they have one voice, there is one voice. So a lot of good things about the community. But there are these internal issues as well. So uh, in church communities, in church families, you know, there can be internal issues. At the end of the day, you know, there are people we are dealing with people. But we need we need the leading of God you know, to be able to work out um, the internal issues or be able to face the external issues that come against us. So um, the church you know, has to stand uh, in, amidst all these things, external pressures, internal pressures. And the church of Acts did. It stood. It withstood all these um, you know, uh, attacks or onslaughts, whatever you want to call it. So that's how things were in the community. All right. So uh, can we pause for a moment? I think we should, in case you have some comments uh, after hearing what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Questions? OK, no questions? All right, then we can uh, move forward. OK, let's go to the next section uh, in Chapter 5 here. So after something like this takes place, what can we expect? 
in the church community. From verse 12 to verse 16, you see um, a, a manifestation of God's glory at the next level. So I told us the church is in revival. The church is already in revival, but even after an incident like this, which is so scary, the power and the presence of God is, you know, it, it is, it continues and it's very, very real. So um, Ananias and Sapphira died, great fear came upon all the people and the works of God continued in the church of Jerusalem. So in verse 12, we read, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. So God is moving powerfully. Okay, God is moving powerfully. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Okay, notice earlier, we saw that they were meeting house to house. You know, they were meeting in the temple. But now, more specifically, uh, we are told about Solomon's porch. Okay, Solomon's porch. Uh, we we saw how the lame man was healed, and um, you know, the people gathered in Solomon's porch. So it was like a you know colonnade, a, a larger space, a larger space. So now the believers were meeting in Solomon's porch because they had increased in number. So they needed a larger space to meet, and when they met in that place the power of god now it continues to flow okay many signs and wonders i don't know why you know luke is a very detailed writer but may, maybe there are too many so he just says okay many signs and wonders he doesn't list them out many signs and wonders were done among the people uh so it's it's a church filled with glory then he also said they were in one accord so it continues to be a church with unity verse 13 Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Okay, so the fear of God was within the church. And when the fear of God is within the church, we notice that people outside are also, you know, walking with the fear of God in a sense, because they are esteeming the believers as oh they are god's people you know, they are uh, uh, people of integrity they are people uh, among whom god moves so signs wonders and miracles are taking place so the believers are being highly esteemed by the outsiders okay so that is the status of the church and uh, the response of the people around verse 14 and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. So this shows <coughs> all the features of the church that I described, plus it's a growing church. People are still being added to the church family. Verse 15, so, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. So the miracles are taking place, which is amazing. But the extent to which the miracles are taking place is something we must note. The sick are being brought into the streets. Did this happen when Jesus was around? Yes, it happened. People were being brought from the nearby cities and they were being lined up for Jesus to heal them. They were being lined up because some people believed that they could touch the hem of his garment and be healed. So, you know, it was it was an amazing time when Jesus did his ministry and Jesus spoke to his disciples, you know, before his departure in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said, you shall do greater things than these. Okay. So Jesus was pointing to the fact that there will come days when those who believe in him will move in the signs, wonders, and miracles that he himself has moved in, and they will give testimony to the power of God. And in the book of Acts, 
you could say the disciples, you know, the first line of leadership that Jesus himself prepared were seeing the manifestation of what had been spoken. So very similar to Jesus' times, people were lining up for healings. People were lining up for the miraculous uh, on the streets even. So the sick were brought. So you can only imagine, you, know, you can just imagine a picture, the city of Jerusalem, uh, something is happening in the city. Earlier, because of Jesus, you know, there was chaos in the city. Um, there, there, uh, his Jesus' trial, you know, it, it divided the city uh, politically, uh, spiritually, in so many different ways. And now, once the disciples have started moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, again, there is something taking place in the city in the name of Jesus. Uh, lots of people are beginning to believe in him. And this community of believers of Jesus is growing. They are moving in signs, wonders, and miracles to the extent that, you know, if Solomon's Porch is the is the venue for church services, right outside, lots of sick people waiting so that you know, they can receive from the ministry of the apostles. And it also seems like uh, God was working in unusual ways. So people were actually expecting even the shadow of Peter to heal them. So would that have happened earlier? Maybe. You know, maybe it would have happened to some. And uh, that is why others were also waiting for Peter's shadow to fall and heal. Uh, so unusual, unusual miracles. We've talked about this. When the anointing of the Lord is through material substances, or in this case, you know, a shadow. A shadow is not a substance, but we can't box God up. You know, God can work in any way He likes because He's God. Even the shadow of Peter. People were expecting that even if His shadow falls on us. We would be healed. So verse 16, also multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. So again, you can just think about the activity, the um, excitement in the city of Jerusalem that news went out to neighboring cities. And as if all the sick people in Jerusalem brought to the, uh, you know, the church uh, folk was not enough. Additionally, the sick people from other cities, the people who are tormented by unclean spirits, they also are being brought uh, into the city of Jerusalem. It, you know, it's it's like, you know, sometimes when we have, uh, or rather we used to have uh, here, uh, it's not uh, common anymore, but crusades and um, uh, large gatherings, people come down from you know faraway cities they fly down they bring in their sick because they've heard that if i attend this meeting you know I'm, people have been healed in the past so maybe i too will be in so something very similar where even from other cities people were coming down to jerusalem to receive from god the beautiful part is the end of verse 16 it says and they were all healed very similar to the way Jesus ministered, you know, Matthew 8. They brought so many people in the evening. They brought people with all kinds of sicknesses, Matthew uh, describes. And they were all healed. Jesus healed them all. And same thing, the same legacy continues with the early church. When they, whoever was brought, they were all healed. So the early church was moving in mighty power signs and wonders. So it was a very, very powerful church when you know the, the Spirit of God began to move upon them. Okay, So when such things are taking place, uh, what response you know, can we expect from the people? We've seen earlier that there's generally a positive response, but there's also a negative response where uh, people mock, people accuse, people, um, you know, take action to kind of harm the apostles and, and God's people. So now 
with the church becoming so famous for the power of God in the city of Jerusalem, what kind of a reaction can we have from the authorities? So verse 17, then the high priest rose up. Okay, so it, it, it looks like the issue of the church growing in this manner uh, had reached its, its limit, you know, so to speak, for the high priest. It was like enough is enough. I've heard too much about these followers of Jesus and, you know, what they're up to. So the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, so the sect of the uh, Sadducees, and scriptures tell us that they were filled with indignation or they were angry, okay, obviously, because it's a threat to their position of authority in the city. So they were angry. And uh, verse 18 says, they laid hands, their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So earlier, who was put in the prison? We had Peter and John. But this time around, they brought the apostles, it says. So, you know, our assumption is that probably 12 of them would have been there. Uh, and they have all now been put in prison. So uh, the reaction is definitely not a positive one. Why prison? Because a second time, they're going to see if they can stop what is being done in the name of Jesus. Okay, so how did um, the uh, how did Peter and John escape the last time? Peter and John uh, were let go by the authorities. Primarily, two notable things were uh, you know in in the passage of Acts four. One was the boldness of Peter uh, and John, and they said, "Hey, come on, these are unlearned unlearned men." But how is it? that they are so bold. So the boldness uh, was something that they observed. And the second thing was the lame man's healing. Now, that miracle was notable. Nobody could question it. So the authorities were afraid that if at all they made it an issue, that their position would be under threat. So it was a notable miracle, or God's work was evident to the people around. Now, we will see how they escape okay, in this particular situation. So let's take a 10 minute break. We will come back and continue. We will pick up from Acts chapter 5 and verse 19. So see you in a bit. Thank you. <laughs> 